Hi, I'm Lena Rao. Uh, we're here with our Ask a VC series um, where we put investors in the hot seat. Uh, joining us today is Megan Quinn, partner at Kleiner Perkins. Welcome, Megan. Thank you for having me. Uh, just to let our readers know, um, you w recently joined Kleiner a few months ago. You were at Square previously, the director of product there, and then spent long time at Google working on a number of things, including location services, maps, and things like that. Um, we're really excited to have you here. Uh, I think one thing I want to talk about um, before we kick off into some of our reader questions is that you recently joined Kleiner a few months ago. Um, you were obviously doing product and, and, and uh, more engineering focused uh, work before. What was the most surprising thing about venture capital that you've learned over the past few months? You know, there's really two things. Um, one, it's even more fun than I thought it would be. Right, um, you get to meet with incredible entrepreneurs, see amazing products and businesses every day. And if you're someone who's intellectually curious, that context switching every hour is really, really invigorating. You get to be a constant student. You learn about things you've never thought about or known about before. So that's really fun. Um, the other big surprise is how humbling it is because people come in and they tell you their dreams. They've made great personal sacrifice, financial sacrifice to sit there and have a conversation with you. And it can be very, very challenging and humbling to have to give feedback that isn't always a check. Yeah, so I I'm curious, you know, what is it like being a VC versus being, you know, sort of in the trenches at Square or Google? You know, now you're still helping um, direct, you know, product vision and things like that. But what is it like sort of being on the outskirts there? I mean, the major difference is that I'm helping other people see their dreams come true as opposed to helping build the dream of the product that I'm working on myself. Um, and it's a very different perspective to have, um, but it's equally exciting and, and I would say uh, sort of satisfying from an investor standpoint. You know, at Kleiner, we believe the check is really the beginning of the relationship and that the hardest part about building meaningful companies is the building process of the company and the product and the team around that product. Um, so while we can help and advise from the outside, we do have to be thoughtful and careful about getting in there ourselves and getting too far into the trenches. Uh, whereas, of course, when you're building the product, you're in the same product and team day in and day out, working with a group of folks to see that come to fruition. Yeah, so considering your background in product and engineering, we have a, a, an interesting question from our reader, Viva. How is your experience working in product management in tech companies from a non-engineering background? You know, it's interesting. Most um, product leads, especially at companies like Google and like Square, um, do have an engineering background. And I will admit my bias when hiring out my team is to find product leads who do have that core competency from an engineering perspective. And really that's because you want to have an understanding of the implications you're making as a product leader. And so if you don't have that technical background, it can be a challenge, it can be an obstacle. That being said, I was at Google for a very long time and worked with the same core group of folks for a very, very long time. And there was a level of trust that was established and, and frankly, a willingness on my part to understand what I did and didn't know um, as it related to the engineering pieces. So it, it worked, but it doesn't always and it can be an obstacle. So from your perspective, we have a lot, we have a lot of our readers who are engineers or um, product managers who want to get into venture eventually. What's your advice for them? So it's interesting. Whenever I meet people who want to get into venture, I always ask why. Um, and the answers are usually range from it just looks like a lot of fun to um, it looks like a really easy lifestyle. And there's two things I'll say is one, it's a lot of fun, but again, it's a lot of work and it's very humbling. And two, it, it is not a very, very easy lifestyle. In fact, some of the hardest working people I know in the Valley are venture capitalists. That being said, if someone has a really compelling reason for why they want to go into investing because they want to help lots of entrepreneurs see their dreams come through because they're excited by the prospect of working with lots and lots of companies. The best way that I know to do it is actually to get that operating experience and is to continue to work in an operating role building products because, in my opinion, some of the very, very best investors are folks that have actually built products and been operators themselves. Yeah, so walk me through your typical day because, you know, what does a VC really do during the day? You know, are you seeing pitches? Are you... Uh, 
you know, having liquid lunches? You know, <laughs> what, what, what is, what's your typical day? Unfortunately, not liquid lunches <laughs> unless you count water. Um, I would say about 60 to 70 percent of my time is spent um, meeting with new entrepreneurs and uh, new companies and evaluating those companies for investment on behalf of Kleiner Perkins. Um, another sort of 30 percent of my time is spent working with our existing portfolio companies, uh, a subset of them where I have relevant expertise to bring to bear. Um, and then other part of that, of course, is helping with Kleiner internally. We are, again, a firm, so we have some operating work to do as well. So your expertise, you, you're currently focused on consumer internet, um, di you know, the digital world. Um, I'm curious, my question, I guess, to you is, where, what's the next wave of disruption for, for mobile specifically? I think you know, that's definitely something that Kleiner has made some, some big bets on with some of your recent investments. But where is there going to be disruption you know, nec the next wave? Sure. Um, so you're absolutely right. Um, mobile is a revolution. This is not an evolution. Um, and every human behavior, every human activity is being reimagined through the prism of a mobile device. And we're seeing lots of interesting developments, of course, from mobile publishing, mobile commerce, social networks. Um, but I think that there's three areas where we can see uh, a lot more development over the next couple of years and where I'd personally like to see a lot more development over the next few years. Um, one is in education. Um, if you think about it right now, when students at any age go into a classroom, they're told to put their phone away, turn it off and put it away. And that is very much like when my parents went into classrooms when they were students and they were told to put their calculator away. And you used your pencil and you did the work and you didn't use that tool. And then slowly but surely the, the educational system realized, okay, this is a tool that actually accelerates students' learning, let's let them use it. I think we're going to see that same shift with mobile devices as well, where we'll recognize that um, both tablets and mobile devices are actually tools that can be force multipliers for learning as opposed to hindrances. Another area that I think is interesting from a mobile development standpoint is consumer health. We've seen a tremendous amount of development and innovation in quote unquote enterprise health over the last 50 years. But we have sort of neglected. What's enterprise health? Well, I mean sort of more traditional um, the medical tools that okay. you, you might see mm -hmm. in a doctor's office or in a hospital. Um, we have seen a tremendous amount of innovation there. But where we sort of lagged is on sort of consumer preventative health. We've, we've forfeited uh, in many ways the opportunity to give consumers the tools so that they can monitor their own health preemptively. And so I think that you look at things like Jawbone Up, which is a really great step in that direction, and how that can help consumers understand their own health. And I think you'll see more in that space. And then finally, you know, mobile penetration and mobile ubiquity is really driving what we've been talking about for some period of time, the, this concept of the Internet of Things. And what's interesting about that to me is that as we all walk around with these mobile devices, they're really proxies for our identity. Mm -hmm. And so because we have this connected proxy of our identity, the world around us can become much, much more responsive um, and much, much more tailored to our preferences. And I think that's very interesting. So you look at companies that We've invested in like Nest, where it recognizes who I am based on my phone, based on my habits, and it, it changes the environment around me right. simply because it knows that it is me for the first time. Right. There's other companies in the space, Lockatron is another, even Square, where because my phone is on me and that's the proxy for me, when I go into a site glass coffee or a restaurant, they already know who I am and I don't have to have any sort of payment experience because my identity is there in the ether. Right, so it's basically your phone as your identity and using that in, in sort of compelling ways around your home or your home, your car. your car, your wallet. I mean, everyone's sort of, the thought now is that your phone is going to become your wallet. It's inevitable. Do you think that? It already is mine. Oh, is it? In well, many cases, yeah. With Square, of course. I mean, <laughs> of course, with Square. But, um, you know, the laggard here is going to be the United States government and the, my driver's license. And so I, I'm going to have to hang on to that for a little while. But I certainly don't walk around with the wallet of gift cards and credit cards and cash that I did five years ago or even a year ago. What do you use? I mean, are you using, you know, do you go to Starbucks and use your Square app? What are you, what Always. Are you using? Okay. What else? Like, uh, you know, what are some of the other mobile apps that, that you're using as your wallet, you know, so I use using your wallet? I use Square a tremendous amount. Um, I use tools that um, previously where I've made it, would have made that purchase in the real world, I'm now doing it through my mobile phone. Um, so this is more of that um, convergence of mobile and e-commerce. Um, so whereas I may have gone online um, to my computer or gone to a store to buy, 
you know, even just practical goods, everyday goods, I now set up subscriptions on Amazon through my phone and I don't even have to think about those things anymore. Yeah, we have an interesting question along those lines from Andrew, which is, what are some of the mobile e-commerce companies that are not yet on the screen of the consumer? Um, and, and so what are you excited about when it comes to mobile e-commerce? See, I think the best mobile e-commerce companies that I've seen to date, um, and this isn't always the case, but it is for e-commerce from my perspective, are the companies that have crossed the chasm from web to mobile very effectively. And, and specifically in that category, I'd look at One King's Lane um, or even a fab. Um, where they did have a web experience first and foremost, but were really successful in transferring that experience to be much more intimate and immediate on a mobile device. In terms of mobile first e-commerce companies, really traditional e-commerce, I think we're still in really early days, but I think we should see some very interesting companies emerge in that space in the next year. So you think that there's actually going to be e-commerce companies that choose mobile first as opposed to web first? Absolutely. There's a level of, again, intimacy and timeliness that the mobile phone provides that you don't have when people have to go back to their desktop or they have to go to their laptop. Interesting. I, uh, I shop a lot on my mobile phone already, and I do notice that things are just a lot easier, and I actually buy more, I think, yep. sometimes when I'm on my mobile phone because it's so easy. The payment has to be seamless. So unfortunately for my husband, he, uh, he doesn't like receiving those credit card bills. But When, when um, done right, it should be pushing a button and getting right. whatever it is that you want. That's absolutely right. Um, I want to take a question and switch gears uh, from one of our readers. Um, and, and this is sort of interesting because I wonder about this too when you're approaching a VC firm or you have a meeting. Andrew, how spiffy, his word was spiffy, does a pitch deck have to be? And what does that look like now? Has it changed? Sure. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of dodge it in some ways and say that it really depends on the investor. Um, I am familiar with investors who don't want to see a pitch deck at all, and I'm familiar with investors who want to see something very, very formal, lengthy, thought out. Um, from my personal perspective, what I want to hear is the story and the vision of the entrepreneur. And if that's done through slides and bullet points, or that's done through images, or that's done through an actual sort of beta testing of the product, it doesn't really matter to me. It's how can you most effectively communicate that vision and sell that vision so that someone else can take it on from an investment standpoint. What's your advice to an entrepreneur who has an idea, um, a vision for something that he or she wants to start, but doesn't really know where to start? You know, wh what's the first step? Oh, you know, when you hear all these ideas, um, I'm assuming that some of these people don't actually have a product to show you. So, is the first step creating a product, or is it? creating a, a business plan? Sure, so it requires less and less capital to start a company these days than it did before. And so you can actually get going building a product um, with very, very little. And, and I say that truly building a product, not necessarily even building a company, and testing a product out in the world to see if you do have consumer fit, or in the case of enterprise, enterprise fit. Um, so my bias is always towards start building. Um, and that can be building a team, so bringing somebody on to make sure that you have the resources and the skill set that you need, but start building that product so that you can really get it out there and get feedback coming in quickly. That's great advice. Well, Megan, thank you so much for joining us today. We're Thanks really excited uh, that you came to TechCrunch TV, and uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon. I'd love to. Thank you. Thanks.